Hello and welcome to another episode of the Melbourne Athletic Development Podcast. As always, this episode of Lateral Think is brought to you with the support of Strength by Numbers. Strength by Numbers have created an integrated clinical and sports performance system. The AXIT system uses force platforms, dynamometry and strain gauges to objectively measure everything from isolated movements to sports performance tasks. The system has greatly enhanced our clinical practice, decision making and objectivity. We are no longer guessing. The greatest thing is its ease of use, both for practitioners and clients. There are no wires, no fixed setup, and it is a fully integrated Bluetooth system. If this sounds like something that would enhance your practice, visit strengthbynumbers.com and tell them that Melbourne Athletic Development sent you. Jack. John, how are you? Very good, mate. So today, we wanted to have a bit of a look at how you select a particular type of exercise Mm -hmm. and or particular type of training Mm. Uh, based on potentially the different drivers for what you're trying to see change. Yes. Obviously, we've seen a lot of people start to use certain activities to get, say, architectural changes. Mm -hmm. Um, And we thought it would be interesting to actually explore that a little bit deeper. Mm. And a concept that we sort of spoke, spoke about in the development of this discussion was around, well... Typically, you would see that if you do the sports performance task or the specific task that person needs to do, so for instance, if it's someone who does manual labor work, can't they just do the job that they're doing? And won't that develop the changes that you need for their system to be optimized? So Mm. therefore, you just hyper-specialize and you'll get the changes you want. Mm. What do you have to say when I ask a question like that? Well... In short, I'm sure a lot of people do do that, you know, from whether it's related to sport or related to physical demands of a particular task. I think one of the things we have to realise is some of the limitations of just only doing that. And it's obviously not to dismiss that when you think about sports development, sports specific is the most transferable. But you have to also appreciate that how someone completes a particular task is based on the particular tools that they have. So, you know, I'm talking about range of movement, I'm talking about strength, I'm talking about power, I'm talking about just overall their level of coordination. So I think a question we have to ask ourselves is when we see someone doing a particular task, what does it look like and what are the things you need to work on? Now, that might be thinking about developing specific or trying to change particular biomechanical elements related to their particular task. So, for instance, sprinting. You obviously do that all the time and thinking about how do I create constraints to change that. But part of that also may be, well, do I need to work on doing more specific development of particular regions or even potentially creating or enhancing particular physiological components to that person to enhance that particular task? Yeah, I think it's interesting because we got into this discussion a little bit with Avish Mm. um, from the VIS and we spoke about how... In terms of the development of, say, an athlete across their their career span, you're looking at an expression of all the features that they have. Yes. And often, what we, as as people who've listened to that, what we found and what we do find is that if you've gone down the really specific path, they have the features that make them able to carry out that sport-specific thing. Mm but they often don't have the ability to create a lot of variability in their function, both from a biomechanical standpoint, but also from a physiological one. Yes. So if you take them away from that really specific type training, they don't necessarily get a huge benefit from it, even if that's the area that they're lacking and you think that that area actually is important for their function. And I think that this opens up an interesting and broad concept that we've we've spoken about a lot, which is in complex systems and in systems that create patterns that emerge um, through the, you know, the combination or confluence of all the factors that contribute to that. Mm. Having lots of tools in there, particularly the tools that are important, is actually really useful for getting a really nice signal that comes out. Yeah, and the most obvious example of this is looking at something like youth development and specialisation. Yeah. So cause if you take a step back and you think of you've got a, a child or an adolescent who's really good at AFL – you know, they're 13 years old, and you think, you know what, this guy's going to become an AFL star. All I'm going to get him to do is do AFL training. And that seems like the logical thing, surely. Like, if you just get them to do sports-specific stuff, by the time they're 20, they're going to be a superstar. The reality is that's actually not the case, at least with quite complex sporting sports like AFL. 
Probably a little bit different with, you know, those more kind type sports when you think about something like chess or golf. But when you start to get into sports that require lots of different variables and components, we don't get that translation. And Mm. this is something that's really obvious when you look at the literature and specialisation. Those kids who specialise early on typically aren't the ones that go on to have successful careers in terms of winning gold medals at the Olympics or making... Um, a professional sporting league. Yeah, it's not always the case though, because you obviously do see the the prodigies, people who say played soccer their whole, you know, their whole youth, and well, they end up becoming, you know, Lionel Messi or something like that. Mm. Um, but they're probably the exception, I guess, in the rule. Hey, well, it depends. I guess that, that comes down to obviously what they're exposed to throughout that development period. Like yeah, just well, because they're playing soccer all the time doesn't mean that they're necessarily. Um, doing only soccer type stuff. Well, no, and that's w- worth clarifying. And you know, another good example of that is someone like Roger Federer, who played tennis growing up. His mother was a, a tennis coach, but he also played uh, other sports. Other sports, and part of that because he was interested in hanging out with his mates, and he really enjoyed soccer and things like that. And it wasn't until his late teens that he realised that shit, he's actually pretty good. And everyone realised like this guy's pretty damn good. <laughs> that he goes, okay, maybe I need to start focusing. So it's not to assume that you don't touch soccer until you're 20, because okay. <laughs> that's also going to be an issue. This this opens up, obviously, you know, we're talking in a broader sense about, like, the overall, you know, participation in a sport, mm. right? But the thing that, and this is why we wanted to have this conversation, we see a lot of research and we see a lot of even clinicians talking about trying to get very specific changes to tissue. Yeah, I think the most common one that has been sort of popularized in the recent research is things like fascicle length yes right and changes to tissue architecture particularly with utilization of say eccentric loading Mm. uh to you know the area that's a lot of research has been done is things like hamstring strain injuries yeah um and the association between reduced injury risk and increased fascicle length Mm. and how that potentially should mean that we do more eccentric training to actually create changes at the tissue. Yeah, and look, I mean, here's the issue, isn't it? Because by no means am I suggesting, I'm sure you're the same, that eccentric training doesn't have value in terms of developing certain capacities and potentially reducing injury. There's obviously issues, though, that come up when you have certain people suggesting that all we should do is, say, eccentric training. I've even heard one coach talk about you shouldn't do the concentric part of the movement. Yes. You should only do the eccentric because that's a protective thing and you should not worry about anything else. Well, and look, an easy way to look at that is, do you think that if all you did was eccentric training and no other type of your training, training that you're going to mitigate all hamstring strain injuries associated with maximal velocity running? Mm. It's a simplistic kind of way of looking at it because obviously eccentric hamstring f- you know, force production is not the only risk factor for the development of hamstring strain injuries. Totally. And we, we briefly talked about this with Adam last week, but I think it's worth highlighting of in injury prevention, the um, recent advocation for things like heavy eccentric loading with hamstring nordic curls has a lot of value. And I think probably one of the big ones is the fact that you're applying mechanical forces to the hamstring muscle that are so great that most people can't actually complete the particular task. Yeah, it's a maximal task. Correct. And like, I actually think that's actually an interesting principle to think of itself. It's tra- it's tra- it's, you essentially are training to actual failure. And that's well, a weird thing because you, as we spoke about when we chatted with Adam, like people aren't doing that with anything else. They're not saying like, totally. let's do maximal squats for your knee health. They're like, what? What are you talking about? Well, and it's something that we've talked about before particularly in say physiotherapy because that's a profession that's often going to be working with athletes during that rehabilitation protocol a lot of physiotherapists a lot of what we're taught in that low force low velocity component of the force velocity spectrum and it's an important component to develop but again i don't see a lot of people going all right i'm going to give you this task you probably won't be able to complete it to begin with but over time, that you'll be able to get better at it. And there seems to be a general... The weird thing about it is it's a very clear acceptance of that as a, you know, a, um, a, a training exercise or a rehabilitation exercise. Mm. But as I said, you, you, won't, you don't get it with anything else. Like, people aren't often prescribing things to failure in other settings. No. When it comes to rehab in particular. No. I mean, it's funny. That's probably one of the big things I take from that literature because... It, it clearly does have to have some protective effect. The, the question here is that correlation versus causation of looking at something like muscle architecture. 
Now, again, I, I realise that when you increase fascicle length, it doesn't allow you to uh, shift the length tension curve to the right, i.e. be able to produce higher amounts of force at a lengthened position. Mm. But there's also a lot of other factors that influence that. Like a good example of that is stretching. Mm. Most long-term stretching protocols, you're probably not changing architecture, but you are seeing improvements in being able to produce forces at longer lengths. And I think the other thing, though, too, here is if you look at one of the other bigger driver for changes in fascicle length, it's the chronicity of doing max velocity sprinting, so greater than 90% of your max velocity. And a, a question I think we need to consider is, what's the difference between doing something like maximal velocity sprinting for someone who needs that for that particular for their sport versus doing something like a Nordic hamstring curl? Because if we think about the biomechanical characteristics of max sprinting, it's obviously much more specific to the particular and it's task. Very, and it's very different, isn't it? Completely. Well, even this morning, I, saw, I know that he he likes to be a curmudgeon, you know, like... But Vern Gambetta put up, again, his whole thing about... There's all these injury prevention programs in place. Mm. And he said it's taking up place of the thing that actually prevents injuries, which is proper training. Yeah. Yeah, and this is where I think sometimes we come undone with, uh, from an injury prevention standpoint of being enamoured with something like fascicle or muscle architecture and thinking, okay, all I need to do is think about applying interventions to improve fascicle length. Okay, let's, let's assume that that is an important factor. But if we think about in terms of the similarity to, say, sprinting and the context in which you do the task, like as, as i.e. being out in the field, it's about as out of context and dissimilar to sprinting as you can get. It, <laughs> it is. is. So, when and, and, that's, and that's Vern's argument. He hates Nordics because he's like, there is no translation of this to sprinting. Well, and look, here it comes back to thinking about, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, like training classification. Because if we think about something like Nordic hamstring curls, it's an exercise that does apply quite high amounts of mechanical force, you're certainly going to get improvements in strength. And if you do enough volume, you're going to get increases in things like hypertrophy. So those are actual potentially valuable attributes because all of a sudden you're enhancing the capacity of the hamstring muscle. All of a sudden it's able to produce larger amounts of force and to be fair, it probably can produce larger amounts of force at longer muscle lengths. And that's clearly somewhat useful for things like sprinting. I think the area that people get undone is do you assume that you can rehabilitate, say, a sprinter or an AFL player purely within the constraints of a gym environment? Mm. Because I think that's one of the other issues you see at the moment is assuming that you can develop all the requirements within a constrained environment like a gym where, again, thinking about the particular specificities of the movement, do you actually have the ability to do that? And do you also have the environmental factors too that influence the behaviour of the system? Well, I think, I think, you know, the interesting thing is... You have much more, and this is you know just my position. I think you have much more success rehabilitating someone back to. If you had a choice between being able to use a rehab space or a gym or the field, I think you've got much more chance of long term success if you did the whole thing on the field. Now, it's unlikely that you're only going to have one, but mm. if you only had one, I would choose to be on the field. Yeah, absolutely. Right, and I think that there would actually be people who would say they were uncomfortable with that. Yeah. Well, I think that there's some, some p- people who are just so comfortable being in the rehab or the gym space mm. that they go, no, 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 they need to go and spend time there. Mm. Um, and I think it's probably an, a nice exercise of your professional capability, whether you actually carry it out or not, but is actually to think about designing things doing if you had limitations like that. Mm. right? And it is possible that you could have limitations like that, particularly if you have... Um, you know, well, I think COVID was a perfect example of that. Mm-hmm. Like, there was a lot of times like you didn't actually even have access to a gym. Hmm. So it's like, how do you create these changes that you want? Mm. And before you spoke about exercise classification, you know, a number of times we've spoken about you know the Bondichuk system of exercise classification. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you shared with me obviously one of you know sensory motor output and and how that sort of there's a similar kind of uh, pyramid that gives you those graduations and steps away from, you know, the really specific task. But if you take something, as you said, like the Nordic hamstring exercise, 
it's not going to, you know, if it's a, it's a pyramid with four different stages. Yeah. It's not going to be in the top two, which are the most specific. It's going to be in the third, maybe even the fourth, probably the third. So it's, it's at least two generations removed from the task. Yeah, and to give some context, so when we think about that hierarchy, we're thinking of competition, then we're thinking of sports specific, and then we're thinking of specific and general preparatory development. Mm. And, yeah, it's interesting to note that, um, I can't think of his first name, but Letterman, who's done some very interesting articles of looking at the sensory motor system and it's been quite... He was a guy who in the 2000s was putting out some useful commentaries about some of the limitations of how people were looking at motor control of this idea of just switching a muscle, quote, on or off. But interestingly, he has a similar hierarchy when you think about the similarity in the context of the particular task and how that influences the sensory motor system. Because I think that's something that people need to realise, that if you think about something like a Nordic hamstring curl from a neuromuscular perspective, it has almost, well not I shouldn't say almost, but it has very little similarity to the neuromuscular patterns of sprinting. Mm. And when you think about it from a biomechanical standpoint, that makes a lot of sense. We think about it from the velocity of movement, we think about the position of the body, we think about um, the position of one leg relative to another and not to mention the contraction and tension of different joints within the kinetic chain so all of a sudden you can start to realize okay there are some dissimilarities between the two and that also influences the behavior of the actual muscle tendon unit at a micro level as well so that's where i think it's useful to think of okay something like a nordic hamstring curl is probably quite good for general development and it, maybe it has some specificity when you think about sprinting because you're working the hamstring muscle more. But then we also need to realise some of the limitations of it. But I think that's probably the next thing we need to think about is like why, um, how do you think about then classifying exercises and why do you do, say, development in the gym with athletes that you work with? Well, I think it's not to, as you, as you suggested, it's not to say that we're thinking that we're, going to necessarily make someone well what you're constantly thinking about is am i giving them the tools to be able to express what they need to in that environment mm. right but the direct translation is not always there and if you look at some of the correlational studies between things like say certain movements in the gym mm. and what that means to the actual performance they're not there mm. or if they are they're only in very small portions mm. And what I think that that starts to tell you, and, and that's in a sport like in sprinting, for instance, that's in a sport that is very much conducive to the utilization of something like the gym. Mm. You know, you go to something like say, field sport, it probably takes even further steps away from that yeah, because sure. of the skill component associated with, say, ball and dexterity and all those things. Yeah. Now, it's not to say that's not useful because obviously there's certain features on, on those, you know, you need physical structure. Mm. You know, if, if it's a sport that has, say, tackling, and if you don't have muscle mass and you don't have the ability to withstand hits, you're going to be in a lot of trouble, mm. right? But that in itself doesn't make you a better player. It just means that you don't get killed, mm. Um, which is an interesting kind of concept. Yeah, I think part, well, one of the other things there too is doing development in the gym can build capacity so you can then start to tolerate higher stresses that you required for the very sport-specific demands yeah. of that particular task. And I think that's probably the thing that shifted in my thinking a lot. It's like, what kind of stresses can I expose them to here that will mean that they can either express something different biomechanically mm. or... The, that they actually have the ability to, as you said, un undertake some sort of stressor. Mm. Um, and I think straight away this makes us, uh, like we've discussed it a fair bit, um, and it's not necessarily with the preparation for the track guys, but you know the use of something like blood flow restriction and yeah. what effect that has on the physiological systems because that has a really potent effect on maybe upregulating metabolic conditioning um, in a unique way, like obviously you can develop metabolic conditioning you know, with any type of training that stresses your metabolic systems. Um, but it opens up the opportunity for athletes who say aren't going to be doing endurance type runs or endurance type sets to actually get that stimulus. And that may be very useful for staving off things like fatigue. Mm. Um, you know, not so much to say necessarily in the track guys but say if you've got a football athlete who is doing repeat sprints maybe that's a really useful way of getting them to be comfortable or their tissue to be comfortable in the environment of say increased 
you know, byproducts of... Lactate and hydrogen ions. Exactly. Well, and this is where I think it is interesting because like like most uh, topics we talk about, there's a level of complexity to it where we take that one stance of we need to think about how biomechanically relevant it is. But at the same time too, it's actually useful to think about, well, what's actually happening at a cellular level and what are the requirements of someone's physiology to complete that task. Because then if we think about something like blood flow restriction for, say, sprint repeatability, you think, well, whenever, when's a sprinter ever doing blood flow restriction? And you're like, well, never. But when you think about it from a solar level, all, all of a sudden you're starting to stress a system at a metabolic in a metabolic uh, way or in its metabolic system that actually potentially has some transfer. And so... I do agree that um, you can also sway too much one way where if you just think about always doing sports-specific development, you're actually probably building uh, a lack of anti-fragility into that person's system. Mm. And, I mean, it's something I'm always interested in. I think you would have a much better understanding of this as a coach of if you're getting someone who's only doing sports-specific or, say, sprinting all the time, do they lose that complexity of their movement or like their coordination yeah. ability? I think that that's one of the key things. I think that they develop a lot of fragility. Mm. Um, and I think that that's one of the problems that you face. And it's often why there's, uh, there's often a lot of discussion online of people who fall into camps of, say, coaching theory mm. that – either slant really specific. So if you think about spring coaching, for instance, and I think like we'll talk about it in a field sport example in a second, but like if you, if you talk about like sprint specific, there's people who are either they go really fast or they go really slow or they just go really fast all the time. Mm. And so they're like, we just want it to be, you know, really, really specific. Mm. There's no point doing things that are not matching what I'm doing. Mm. Then there's the people who have that contrast of like really fast or really slow. And then there's the people who I think sit in the middle and they do what you would consider like almost medium intensity work. They do work that's in that zone of maybe between 70 and 90% relatively often. And I've seen criticism of programs like that even of athletes who've gotten a lot of success doing programs like that and saying, oh, well, they would do so much better if they did training that was more specific and more intense. But the reality is these people are doing really well and they're Mm. getting performances out that maybe they wouldn't get if they were doing that really, really specific training. And just to give context, are are we talking about elite athletes here? Are we talking? Okay, right. Like, uh, like, I was just wondering, does uh, that also depend on their training history? So I'll I'll give an example. And some people might know this example, but but they may not. So, And I'm not sure if the training has changed, but I'm not going to... You know, like people can argue that themselves. So there's a coach called Lance Browman, right? Some people like him, some people don't. He's got a bit of a checkered history, but he currently coaches in Florida and he's got a really, really, you know, high level squad, including, you know, current world champions, Olympic champions. If you look at his training for the guy that at the moment looks like, if there's anyone who's close to, say, breaking Bolt's 200 meter record, it's a guy named Noah Lyles. If you look at a lot of their training, they do a lot of stuff that, it's fast, but then they also do a lot of stuff that's sort of longer distances or say like speed endurance runs that involves them being quite tired, doing repeat runs um, and doing a lot of training that is not, you know, one out, one off, 100% all out type training. They're doing lots of repeated stuff. Mm. And this guy's had a lot of success, probably more in that 200, 400 zone. So it makes maybe more contextual sense in that because of the type of training. Mm. But you still got people who are running extremely fast, um, and he's had success with people running the hundred meters as well. You mm. know, like he coached Tori Bowie to win the world title, the world championships in two thousand seventeen, I believe it was. Um, so it's not that, and you know, he had Veronica Campbell Brown who did really well over one hundred and two hundred. Um, so it's not like it, it's not the case. Mm. And I've seen criticism of his program before of like why do they do and again this is online pundits just talking absolute bullshit but like why do they do so much sort of medium sort of intensity stuff rather than doing like really really fast stuff all the time Mm -hmm. and the thing that i think that's important to note here is i think that what it does is it starts to develop some of these features that we talk about that are creating variability for them you know it's not just Mm -hmm. 
so specific in terms of like they do really fast stuff, which that does condition the tissue both architecturally and from a metabolic sense to deal with that, mm. right? But I think it's too simplistic because we don't really understand. Like one of the things that I always find interesting, and we obviously we had this conversation with the Vish, um, you know, some of the conversations I've had with him and even one of the mentor coaches that I've worked with who's saying like, when we take measures physiologically, we take them after the event, right? We actually don't really know what's going on during the event because it's very hard to say take lactate measures while someone's moving. Mm. Now, there are tricks that they're trying to do stuff like that, mm. you know, or continuous monitors of these kind of things. But, like, we don't know what the environment is during these kind of events. And potentially it's different to what we theoretically believe that it is. Mm. So for that reason, maybe you do need to have more tolerance for metabolic stress in maximal sprints, even though on the surface it doesn't seem that you would need a lot of lactate capacity, right? And that in itself, I think, starts... The fact that people have had success doing that kind of stuff tells you that maybe there's benefit there that isn't immediately clear from you know the idea of doing very specific stuff. And the example that I would give from a like a team sport thing is, you know, there's a really big concept that is very, very prominent in things like soccer. It's like everything should be on the ball. Mm. You always have the ball. You know, it, don't worry about doing training off the pitch. Mm. But I think that leads to a similar sort of problem mm-hmm. where you haven't exposed them to different stresses. And I brought up the example in one of our recent podcasts of uh, Tom Travojevic who season before last had had these series of hamstring injuries and some of them quite severe. And when they actually analysed the games, they realised he wasn't actually going as fast in the games and he didn't have as many high-speed efforts as what he was capable of. Mm. And so what they were having to do was supplement the amount of high-speed running he was doing because that expanded his window outside of what he was being exposed to in Mm. games. Mm. And that, to me, is why you're, you're potentially adding that sort of different stimuli to the training now it's not to say that you do 90 percent of your stuff as it's probably the other way around where it's like 90 percent is really specific but there's a 10 percent window or 20 percent window of st- and well i guess it's probably the 80 20 rule isn't it <laughs> which is you know the pareto principle um that 20 percent of the stuff you do probably needs to have enough variability in it and enough expansion of your system's capacity whether that be at an architectural level whether it be um, at a metabolic conditioning level, whether it be an environmental level um, or sensory level, whatever it is, to expand your envelope for variability and or the fact that we don't really understand what's going on in some of those internal systems yeah. under the conditions of stress in, you know, in sport. Yeah, and I think what that highlights is even if it's only 20%, that 20% really matters. But I think the other thing I think of too and – Perhaps I'm interested to hear if you agree. If in something like sprinting, if all you're doing is max velocity, you're doing two things. You're creating a high amount of stress, which limits the amount you can train, but you're also creating a high amount of fatigue, which reduces the complexity of patterns you can create. Because I think one of the things that is important to remember is elite athletes, even in a, a, a relatively, you could say, simple task like sprinting, there is slight variability in their movement patterns. And so if you're in, under a highly fatigued state all the time, one thing that we see is a reduction in that coordination. So I think that sort of also makes sense too of, well, how do I make sure that there is enough complexity and variability in their movement, which is actually advantageous from a fatigue resistance standpoint, particularly when you start to get into longer distances, like mm. a 200 metre. I think, uh, yeah, I think this is... You just made me think of something that, as again, I was discussing with Avish mm. um, in a training session, but is this concept of specificity, I think, is attractive, right? Whether it be in a rehab setting, you know, people are like, oh, we try and mimic what they do on the field in the gym mm. or, um, mm. you know, in a rehab space. You were telling me about an interesting exercise before for... The, the yeah, it was a dumb trees. exercise I saw on Twitter yesterday. But um, <laughs> the reason that I think it's attractive is because... I think the transfer is more immediate, mm. right? And so people get excited by that. And that's not to say that you don't want immediate transfer, but it gives you results in the short term, which is super attractive because mm. you're like, well, I'm seeing the fruits of my labor straight mm. away. 
The question I think you have to ask yourself is, does that lead to the most amount of benefit later on in the ultimate performance of their task? Yeah. Right? Do you need more tools to get a really good result than just the ones that appear to be immediately obvious? Well, I, I think part of that, though, too, is thinking about the what we call the maturation of the system. Because let's say, for instance, you've got a 15-year-old kid who's got some talent in a particular sport – and they've got no training history, for instance, in the gym. Well, the reality is you probably could do anything with them and you, you potentially will see some improvement. And the reason for that is is if they haven't developed any type of strength capacity in the gym, then building that particular capacity is probably going to have some level of transfer. I think the question is, do you see the same result then for, say, an elite athlete who's got very high maturation in their system? No, and you won't, but at, at that time, right, so like... This is the trade-off. So, for instance, for that younger athlete, if you did really specific stuff, mm. so you went really heavy in the gym, maybe you did eccentric stuff to so increase fascicle length, you would probably see a huge growth in their performance, say, you know, whether on the field or on the track, mm. right? But ultimately, that may not be beneficial for them long-term mm. because you've actually gone straight to the task that is you know, the ultimate level of not only specificity, but the magnitude of what you're applying is probably reasonably high. Mm -hmm. And as Well, it's going to be high because, as you said, they haven't been exposed to a lot of stress. Mm. So if you apply something that's more specific, it generally has higher intensity to it anyway. Mm. And what that leads to is a real problem, right? Because you, by doing that and by exposing them to that magnitude of stressor, what you've potentially taken away is the benefit that you get by broadening their overall stress capacity. Mm. And this is kind of what you're asking is, do you see the benefit or the decrement, uh, detriment in the long term? The answer is what happens is potentially you have closed some doors or windows behind you that you can no longer then use as a stress stimulus. Mm. Right? Because what we want as humans, and I think this is the the key thing, it doesn't matter what it is, in any complex adaptive system, what it's looking for is stresses of increasing um, either variability or magnitude in order to actually keep expanding its capability. So the question then, and I, I, this is something that we've talked about before and I think you've been good at uh, reining me in because I quite like this idea of let's just build lots and lots of diversity and you, and you often say, look, true, but at the same time too, if we start to get too lateral... We're actually potentially... It depends on how old the person is yeah. or where their performance is at. So, like, if you've got someone who's 30 years old and has been training for 15 years, the stimulus that you're creating there is too many generations removed from what their task is. And mm. the magnitude of those stimulus probably has to be so high to create an overall growth in that system that mm. you're probably entertaining something that doesn't make a huge amount of benefit to them. Yeah. Right? However, if it's, as you said, a 15-year-old who's done no training, almost any training will be beneficial, mm. right? As long as it's not going in a direction that's completely against it. So, for instance, if you've got a, a soccer player and you say, we're just going to, well, actually, probably would still be beneficial. I was going to say, if you say, well, we're just going to do some swimming for conditioning, but it probably isn't the worst idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, but say, say, if, say, for instance, if you've got a, a track athlete and you say, and they're a 100-meter sprinter and you say, we're going to do you know, we're just going to jog for all of your training. Mm. That probably in itself is the wrong type of variability. You know, yeah. you're, you're applying an intensity of stimulus that's too low to actually get beneficial, beneficial changes in the task. But I think what you're also highlighting here too is if you're, say, working at an AFL club and you've got a 18-year-old a, um, first year out who str strained their hamstring – the rehabilitation process for them is probably going to look quite different to the 32-year-old at the club who's been there for 14 years. Yeah. It's probably had a lot of particular development through that period. Yeah, and I think it, what this sort of starts to bring up, and, I, and you know, I know we're jumping all over the place, so it, this may be confusing for people, but what I think we're trying to highlight more than anything is, as it always goes, it depends on the individual that's in front of you about mm. what you're trying to develop. Mm. And often it's about doing the analysis on their profile and understanding 
they have these features, but they don't have these features. Mm. And my job is to see which ones I need to fill in, right? And that's on that spectrum then or two of like, is it, do we need to work on very sports specific components? For instance, like their running mechanics, mm. or do we need to work on general development? Because I'm seeing that they're actually just quite weak overall. And then you have to put that into the contextual environment of what they're doing. So mm. as I said, if someone's older and their career is nearly over, are you going to divert to develop features that, ultimately maybe are beneficial but Mm. not as closely correlated with the performance because maybe that's an investment in time that you won't get back and Mm. you won't get the benefits in time to actually be able to use those so you're not gonna you know for as as if we keep using this 15 year old and 30 year old example the 15 year old they have their career ahead of them Mm. so it's not a huge danger if you start to broaden their horizon 30 year old if you spend two years developing really general features, by the time that they go to use it, the career might be over. Mm. So you've actually lost that opportunity. Mm. And that's where, you know, implementing very specific stuff or things that do create, you know, architectural change or whatever it is may be useful as long as it's not too far removed from what task they're doing. Mm. Yeah, yeah. She makes me think of, I can't remember if Richard shared this with us. It was something that I remember him telling me once, Richard Newsham West, that is, about working with a distance runner who kept getting stress fractures. And then one season he said, all I want you to do this season is just do trail running. Mm. I was like, really? He goes, yep, that's all I want you to do. And, um, and it's probably it's an interesting example because he's obviously still running. He's still getting a lot of that metabolic conditioning, but uneven surface and probably slowing down his pace. He didn't get any further stress fractures. And... That actually makes a lot of sense because I think one of the issues you commonly face when you start to become a professional athlete is you are refining what you're doing in your training stimulus, which is important from a performance standpoint, but that also then potentially makes you lose certain physical attributes. So for a distance runner, one of the issues they have is because of the very um, linear running that they do on a flat surface, you're only creating mechanical forces through your skeletal system in a particular way that potentially uh, predisposes you to stress fractures. And by adding variability in that situation of, say, trail running, you're creating a lot of different forces in a lot of different planes that appears to, that, you know, in that example, help mitigate injury. It makes me think, like, this can be a tricky area when you're developing rehabilitation programs or you're developing and, and going through the stages of that. Do you, in your mind, like have ways in which you kind of navigate what that individual person needs? Well, I think... And, whether, and like, you know, to give you an example, you know, whether you go a little bit more lateral or whether yeah, you keep yeah. to very specific and you want maybe even tissue changes or you want to mimic the biomechanics of that? Yeah, I think actually another thing we're talking about too is do you actually have the resources available to develop that potential spectrum? Because I think that's the other sometimes limitation that a lot of, say, physiotherapists... Uh, meet is do they actually have access to the appropriate equipment to develop those attributes because i even think of that well to go answer your question i think part of that comes to understanding their training history and their current training status to get an idea of what is the development of their system overall have they actually gone through appropriate general development that you would expect at a younger age to build that breadth of capacity but then at the same time, as they've started to get into a particular sport, develop more specialist capacities related to that sport. Uh, and then the other big one, of course, is then the, the objective measuring that you do too because one of the things that's going to give you an indication of their general capacity development is looking at the capacity of different regions in the body. So I think that's one of the big things to really understand is what when you look at their overall general development do they meet certain milestones that you expect and more importantly from what they're telling you from a training perspective have they built up specific training stimulus so that they can actually meet the demands and and magnitudes of stresses applied from now concentrating in a particular activity Mm. yeah i think yeah that that's an interesting one because i think that that concept you know, for the people who are listening that have more of a track background, I think, or even weightlifting, I think is an example. And I have this, I have this discussion, and I have this debate basically with a lot of people who are in, say, strength sports, whether they be powerlifters, weightlifters, or track athletes. 
who tend to take the mindset of this idea of central nervous system fatigue. Mm-hmm. All right, and what that means, I think, is hard to actually be able to define, right? Yeah, and In, uh, some people suggest we shouldn't be looking at that way anyway. Well, like, look, look at Roger I think Anoka's work. Yeah, I think the way in which we probably need to think about this is by from a you know a, a central nervous system point of view, I your brain's ability to both sense and create motor tasks. Mm. Have you stressed the system to a point where those things have been inhibited in some manner? Mm-hmm. All right. So I think that that's probably the really simplistic way of seeing like whatever central nervous system fatigue is, right? And it usually occurs through a maximal intensity of activity, mm-hmm. right? So you'll see a reduction in their ability, as I said, to, to either sense things or to be able to affect motor output. And one of the arguments that I often have with people is that to me, all that really is, is that you haven't exposed them to things that are anywhere near that level of stressor. Mm. Because I don't know that the central nervous system is different to other systems in the body. Mm. Um, It may have its own uniqueness when it comes to, say, timelines, Mm. but I don't think it's not like every other area of the body that has plasticity that if you expose it to some level of stress and you gradually increase the magnitude of that, like you don't have a huge jump, it will adapt to the, that exposure. Well, of course. I mean, if you think about some of the big f- factors associated with central nervous system fatigue, part of it is related to looking at um, like arterial gas, you know, things like carbon dioxide development. And the other big one is just chemicals and neurotransmitters. Mm. So at the central nervous system has plasticity like any system to be able to build up some of the um, some of the particular pathways to be able to clear those things or even just tolerate them better. And the reason that I bring this up is I think that what your job is as either someone in a rehabilitation setting or even as a performance setting as a coach is to, as you said, assess how much stress this person has been exposed to. And that can be very much the physiological training stress, but Mm. I think it also is very much contextual. Mm. I think it has those elements built into it. So, for example, if you're rehabilitating a soccer player back to play, their ability to concentrate through the game, to me, is an indication of what their sensory motor system is doing. Yeah, yeah. And if you expose someone to, and I had this discussion actually with someone during the week, obviously the Socceroos have been playing the World Cup Mm -hmm. and people were saying, you know, why do we get so fatigued in the second half of games? And my obvious point was not that they're unfit Mm. in terms of running, conditioning, all those kind of things. And if you look at a lot of the general discussion that I've had with people that I know that work in A-League and in uh, elite soccer in Australia... I'd say Australian players generally are considered some of the fittest players in the world. All right. Right? And it's got to do with lots of different features, one of them being that our mentality always is that you should be training hard and Mm. working hard. It's very much an Australian philosophical trait of team sport. And where we tend to lack is on the technical side. Mm. You know, our skill set is not the same as some of them, you know, the Brazilians, the Argentinians, you know, the French team, all these kind of things. Yeah. But... We're physically well conditioned. And the, to me, immediately it was obvious that the reason that we we're fatiguing is because the level of concentration that was required was much higher. Mm. Now, there's also the part of whether you've got possession or don't have possession. If you're running around trying to set defensive structures all the time, you, you are going to get tired. But the big one on my end is the level of concentration that's needed when you need to control every single thing. To like in a in a sense so that you don't get scored against or whatever and that to me shows you that like you can be um you know physiologically exposed to the stresses yeah. but there is that contextual side of like this is a new level of play and it's you highlight a good point here because it's not it's not just about having the metabolic conditioning because yes that's important but the the ability to tolerate the cognitive load for the whole 90 minutes and one of the things that this reminds me of too, for those people who are interested obviously in track, which I know there are a few people, um, there's a really good 
short number of snippets of talks of um, a coach named Dan Pfaff while he was in the UK talking to their team. Um, and he talks about the fact that he thinks that too many of their athletes in the UK at the time were doing too many low-stress competitions, mm. right? And then when they, they did expose themselves to high-stress competitions, the response was very negative on their, let's call it their central nervous system capabilities, mm. but like on a general sense, their performance would drop or they would experience a lot of fatigue. And to me, that's not to do with the physiological stress applied because it's probably not that different. But the amount of psychological and emotional stress that they get from that different context is the main thing that's changing that. Mm. And I think one of the things that we should be looking at in terms of stress application is does this person have the ability to meet those physiological demands, Mm. right? Whether they be very biomechanically sensitive or whether they be very um, metabolically sensitive to the task that they're doing. Yeah. You know, but do they also have, they had the contextual environment upregulated to the point where their whole system is exposed to a stressor that's going to be similar or close to. And that's where I see that, like, we, we see that people need to almost, like, this is to give you context. And I think this is why as you get older, it gets harder. I find it's get, as you get athletes get older, in training, you don't necessarily see anywhere near the level of performance as what you do in competition. And the reason is it's very hard for them to get the internal emotional motivation to completely utilize everything that their system is capable of under that level of limited emotional stress. Yeah, and I think what you're really highlighting here is in a constrained environment, even if there are biomechanical similarities, even if there are development of physiological components yeah. related Architecture to Architecture or metabolic If you're not in the right context or environment, you're really missing a, 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 vital, a, element. a, a vital element. And I think that's actually, I know just talking to, to colleagues of ours who work in elite sport, where I know for a lot of different uh, elite sporting environments, there's very much protocols that they follow where they tick all the boxes of what they expect them to be able to do from a phys- physical performance standpoint to go, you know, your calf can tolerate this training load and it can tolerate the velocity, force components, blah, blah, blah. But then they go back to playing and they blow out their calf again. Mm-hmm. Now, I think one of the things that might be is maybe there's a particular system they haven't developed. Maybe it's related to, say, metabolic conditioning. But is there appropriate steps for them to be able to tolerate the psychological and emotional demands of that particular task? And the reason I say this is, like, I have this argument, uh, you know, we, as I mentioned before, I have this argument with strength athletes. And one of the things that I think is interesting is, you know, they'll come off their competition and they'll have done, if it's in weightlifting, six lifts or in powerlifting, nine lifts. Mm-hmm. And like, oh, I was dead for weeks and weeks and weeks and now I need a huge period of time to do a, you know, a build-up. And I'm not saying they're not tired, they are. Mm. But one of the things that I think is the major issue for them is often they compete maybe three times a year. Mm. And to me, the reason they're not developing the ability to tolerate those things is because they're actually not doing enough competition to get that contextual stress level often enough that their system actually gets used to it. Mm. Now, I'm not saying they compete every week. Mm. That doesn't make sense either. Um, but or it may, That may be too stressful. But the, the interesting thing that I think would be a nice experiment to run even as a coach is could you get someone to compete maybe once a month or once every six to eight weeks? Because if you did that and they were doing, you know, six, eight, ten competitions a year, what would happen? Mm. Would they crash and burn? Mm. Or would they actually just get really good at being able to tolerate that level of stress? Mm. Um, and... I don't have the answer to that. I don't know. And there's probably people that have done this kind of stuff and maybe they've had success or maybe they haven't and that's what's influencing it. But I think it it highlights something really clear, which is you need to consider how you keep applying stress to that individual. And sometimes that needs yeah. to be very specific or sometimes well, it needs to have enough variability in it that it's expanding their overall system. Yeah, and actually it really highlights a big point here when we think about exercise classification is – the largest stress you can apply is, is competing because it's going to apply physical, psychological, there's technical elements, metabolic elements, everything. But often, and I think the role that we have is thinking, 
is there a particular subsystem that needs further development and do I need to actually constrain the training environment to really work on building up the mechanical stress I apply mm. or the metabolic stress? Because if you're applying different stresses to different part, different systems of the body, it's going to limit the overall magnitude of stress that you can apply. Mm. It's actually a really good way to think about it is understanding that you can develop individual systems in, say, the gym setting, for instance, but then you need to make sure that or be cognizant of the fact that when it comes to competition, you're training, you're stressing all the systems. And so you need to think of, are all those subsystems developed? And how do I make sure that I have a structure to returning to play to make sure that I'm stressing those systems evenly and at the same time towards getting back to actually getting on the field or mm. track or whatever it may be? Yeah. And I think that's where, you know, and... Uh, we probably have gone in different sort of tangents and circles, but I think the key point that we're trying to make is that if you think that you are going to develop one area and think that that creates the solution to a much more broad and complex puzzle, Mm. then you're probably missing the element that is every single, you know, sensory motor task is influenced by multiple things. And one of the key ones is the environment. Mm. So just because you've got longer fascicle lengths, not that that's good or bad or indifferent, but that's not the answer, mm. right? That's one part of an equation that is much more complicated than one variable. Mm. Actually, it makes you think of, you know, we've talked before about what is an injury mm. and um, um, it's something along the lines of the inability of the musculoskeletal system to solve a particular problem i actually think that we need to probably think a bit more holistically because it's not just the musculoskeletal system no no no, we have you you left out the actual definition in our presentation the other day that we changed about two months ago go on then well Um, we we spoke about it the fact that it's due to either a sensory or some other i mean what the other term i gotta remember the term but Mm. it was like it involved like due to some sort of sensory or Oh yeah, actually, that's I actually came up with that updated definition, yeah. didn't I? <laughs> Got to start practicing more what I preach, hey. Yeah, <laughs> I was very surprised when you presented that to someone. Yeah, yeah. Because um, as I said, it was your definition. Yeah, yeah. No, I need to update that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we talked about this online. <laughs> well, people, people probably be like, "What the hell are you guys talking about?" <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um, all right. On that, is there anything else that you wanted to? You know, I know you had a series of sort of discussion points there. Was there anything else that you wanted to highlight around this, that understanding what stresses you're creating, understanding that, you know, both the biomechanical and or the very specific sort of uh, structural changes are not, this, you know, that at a simple level is not the total equation? Mm. Um, yeah, was there anything else that you... No, look, I think we've really highlighted the main points. The only other thing I thought of, and we briefly mentioned this, is... I think one thing that's very interesting from my perspective of thinking about developing certain physiological aspects of a system is the more you learn about uh, physiology and particular cellular pathways, the more you realise that different um, variables can develop that particular particular component. So, for example, we talked a bit before about blood flow restriction and talking about um, its application or potential application for sprint repeatability. So that is, if you get someone to put on pressure cuffs and get them to do, say, resistance training, you're creating quite a large metabolic stress that enhances the system's ability to tolerate and deal with things like lactate and hydrogen. And I think one of the other interesting things too is potentially be able to replenish things like your creatine storage systems more quickly And I think that's where understanding physiology is really valuable because it makes you start to think about how you can stress a system in different or novel ways as opposed to just trying to do sprint repeats on the track because although that will create metabolic stress, it also creates a very high mechanical stress and that limits the amount that that person can actually tolerate. But then I think at the same time too, we really need to make sure that we look at it from that much more holistic picture of what are the specific requirements and demands for that particular sport and task and what are the systems involved? And now have I actually assessed and ticked all the boxes that are required for that person to actually getting back to sport whilst trying to mitigate injury or re-injury? All right. Thank you very much for your time, Jack. Thank you, John.